All right, chapter 192, The Mint, The Forty Thieves. Reader, if you stroll down that portion of the Southwark Bridge Road, which lies between Union Street and Great Suffolk Street, you will perceive midway, and on your left hand, a large mound of earth heaped on an open space, doubtless intended for building ground. At the southern extremity of this mound, on which all the offal from the adjacent house is thrown, and where vagabond boys are constantly collected, is the entrance to an assemblage of miserable streets, alleys, and courts, forming one of the vilest, most dangerous, and most demoralized districts of this huge metropolis. Metropolis. The houses are old, gloomy, and somber. Some of them have the upper part beginning with the first floor, projecting at least three or three feet over the thoroughfares, for we cannot say over the pavement. Most of the doors stand open and reveal low, dark, and filthy passages, the mere aspect of which compels the passerby to get into the middle of the way for fear of being suddenly dragged into those sinister dens, which seem fitted for crimes of the blackest dye. This is no exaggeration. Even in the daytime, one shudders at the cutthroat appearance of the places into the full depths of whose gloom the eye cannot entirely penetrate. But by night, the mint, for it is of this district that we are now writing, is far more calculated to inspire the boldest heart with alarm than the thickest forest or the wildest heath ever infested by banditti. The houses in the mint give one an idea of those dens in which murder may be committed without the least chance of detection, and yet that district swarms with population. But of what kind are its inhabitants? the refuse and the most criminal of the metropolis. The Mint was once a sanctuary like Whitefriars, and although the law has deprived it of its ancient privileges, its inhabitants still maintain them by a tacit understanding with each other to the extent of their power. Thus, if a villain of whom the officers of justice are in search takes refuge at a lodging in the, in the Mint, the landlord will keep his secret in spite of every inducement. The only danger which he might incur would be at the hands of the lowest description of buzz gloaks, dummy hunters, area sneaks, and vampers who dwell in that district. There is no part of Paris that can compare with the mint in squalor, filth, or moral depravity. No, not even the street in the island of the city where Eugene Sue has passed his celebrated tapis franc. Let those who happen to visit the mint after reading this description thereof mark well the countenances of the inhabitants whom they will meet in that gloomy labyrinth. It was about nine o'clock in the evening when the resurrection man, wrapped in a thick and capacious peacoat, the collar of which concealed all the lower part of his countenance, turned hastily from the Southwark Bridge Road into Mint Street. The weather was piercingly cold and the sleet was peppering down with painful violence. The resurrection man accordingly buried his face as much as possible in the collar of his coat and neither looked to the right nor left as he proceeded on his way. To this circumstance may be attributed the fact that one so cautious and wary as he should now fail to observe that his motions were watched and his steps dogged by a lad whose countenance was also well concealed by a high collar which was drawn up to his ears. In order to avoid unnecessary mystification, we may as well observe that this youth was Henry Halford. The resurrection man pursued his way along Mint Street and suddenly turned into a small court on the left side. There he knocked at a door in a peculiar manner, whistling a single sharp shrill note at the same time, and in another moment Halford saw him enter the house. Well, Mr. Tidkin, said a boy of about fourteen who had opened the door to admit the formidable individual with whom he was evidently well acquainted. A precious cold night, ain't it? Very, my lad, answered the resurrection man, turning down his collar so that the light of the candle which the boy held gleamed upon his cadaverous countenance. Is the bully ground at home? A reply in the affirmative was given, and the boy led the way up a narrow and dilapidated staircase to a large room where a great number of youths, whose ages varied from 12 to 18, were seated at a table drinking and smoking. The organization of this society of juvenile reprobates required a detailed notice. This is The association consisted of 39 co-equals and one chief who was denominated the Bully Grand. The fraternity was called the Forty Thieves. Whether in consequence of the founders having accidentally amounted to precisely that number, or whether with the idea of emulating the celebrated heroes of the Arabian tale, we cannot determine. The society had, however, been established for upwards of 30 years at the time of which we are writing, and is in existence at this present moment. 
The rules of the association may thus be briefly summed. The society consisted of 40 members, including the Bully Grand. Candidates for admission are eligible at 12 years of age. When a member reaches the age of 18, he must retire from the association. This rule does not, however, apply to the Bully Grand, who is not eligible for that situation until he has actually reached the age of 18 and has been a member for at least four years. Each candidate for membership must be guaranteed as to eligibility and honor, that honor which is necessary amongst thieves, by three members of good standing in the society, and should any member misconduct himself or withhold a portion of any booty which he may acquire, his guarantees are responsible for him. The Bully Grand must, be 12, must find 12 guarantees amongst the oldest members. His power is in most respects absolute, and the greatest deference is paid to him. The modes of proceeding are as follows. The metropolis is divided into 12 districts, distinguished thus. 1. The Regent's Park. 2. Pentonville. 3. Hoxton. 4. Finsbury. 5. City. 6. Tower Hamlets. 7. Westminster. 8. Pimlico. 9. Hyde Park. 10. Grosvenor Square. 11. Lambeth. 12. The Borough. Three members are allotted to each district and are changed in due rotation every day. Thus, the three who take the Regent's Park District on a Monday pass to Pentonville District on Tuesday, the Hoxton District on Wednesday, and so on. Thus, 36 members are every day deployed in the district service. The Bully Grand and the three others in meantime attend to the disposal of the stolen property and to the various businesses of the fraternity. In every district, there is a public house or boozing ken in the interest of the association, and to the landlords of these flash cribs is the produce of each day's work consigned in the evening. The house in the mint is merely a place of meeting once a fortnight, a residence for the Bully Grand, and the central depot to which articles are conveyed from the care of the district boozing kens. The minor regulations and bylaws may thus be summed up. Of the three members allotted to each district, the oldest member acts as the chief and guides the plan of proceedings according to his discretion. Should any member be proved to have secreted booty, his guarantees must pay the value of it, and with them rests the punishment of the defaulter. General meetings take place at the headquarters in the Mint on the first and third Wednesday in every month, but if the Bully Grand wishes to call an extraordinary assembly or to summon any particular member or members to his presence, he must leave notices to that effect with the landlords of the district houses of call. The members are to effect no robberies by violence nor to break into houses. Their proceedings must be effected by sleight of hand, cunning, and artifice. All disputes must be referred to the Bully Grand for settlement. The booty must be converted into money and the cash divided fairly between all the members every fortnight, a certain percentage being allotted by way of salary to the, grand, to the bully grand. Such are the principles upon which the association of the 40 thieves is based. Every precaution is adopted by means of the guarantees to prevent the admission of unsuitable members and to assure the fidelity and honor of those who belong to the fraternity. When a member gets into trouble, persons of apparent respectability come forward to give the lad a character, so that the magistrates or judges are quite bewildered by the assurances that it must be a mistake, that the prisoner is an honest, hard-working boy belonging to poor but respectable parents in the country, or that so convinced is the witness of the lad's innocence that he will instantly take him into his service that the magistrate will discharge him. While a member remains in prison previous to trial, the funds of the association provide him with the best food allowed to enter the jail, and if he be condemned to a term of incarceration in the House of Correction, he looks forward to the banquet that will be given in the Mint to celebrate the day of his release. Moreover, a member does not lose his right to a share of the funds realized during his imprisonment. Thus, every inducement is adopted to prevent members who get into trouble from peaching against their comrades or making any revelations calculated to compromise the safety of the society. It was a fortnightly meeting of the society when the Resurrection Man visited the house in the Mint on the occasion of which we are now speaking. The forty thieves were all gathered around a board formed of several rude deal tables placed together and literally groaning beneath the weight of pewter pots, bottles, jugs, and so forth. The tallow candles burnt like stars seen through a mist so dense was the tobacco smoke in the apartment. At the upper end of the table sat the bully ground, a tall, well-dressed, good-looking young man with a profusion of hair but no whiskers, and little of that bluish appearance on the chin which denotes a beard. His aspect was therefore even more juvenile than was consistent with his age, which was about twenty-five. He possessed a splendid set of teeth, of which he seemed very proud, and his delicate white hand, which had never been applied to any harder work than picking pockets, was waved gently backward and forward when he spoke. Around the table there were fine materials for the study of, of a phrenologist. Such a 
concatenation of varied physiognomies, whoo, there are a lot of big words in this sentence, uh, was not often to be met with because none of the charities nor amenities of life were there delineated. Those countenances were indices only of vice in all its grades and phases. The resurrection man was welcomed with a hum of applause on the part of the members and with outstretched hands by the bully grand near whom he was invited to take a seat. The business of the evening is over, Mr. Tidkins, said Mr. Tonks, for so the bully grand was named. And we are now deep in the pleasures of the meeting, as you see. Help yourself. There are spirits of all kinds and pipes or cigars, whichever you prefer. Have you any information to give me? inquired Tidkins in a low tone. Plenty, but not at this moment, Mr. Tidkins. Take a glass of something to dispel the cold, and by and by we will talk on matters of business. There's plenty of time, and many of my young friends here would no doubt be proud to give you a specimen of their vocal prowess. Let me see, whose turn is it? Larry Lipkins, sir, whispered a boy who sat near the bully grand. Oh, Larry Lipkins is it, and said Tonks aloud. Now, Brother Lipkins, the company are waiting for an opportunity to drink your health and song. Mr. Lipkins, a sharp-looking, hatchet-faced, restless youth of about 16, did not require much pressing ere he favored his audience with a sample of vocal melody. Bravo, bravo, echoed on all sides when his elegant effusion was brought to a close. The bully grand then rose and spoke in the following manner. Gentlemen, in proposing the health of our excellent brother, Larry Lipkins, my, I might spare eulogy his merits being so well known to us all, but I feel that there are times when it is necessary to expatiate somewhat on the excellent qualities of the leading members of our honorable society in order to encourage an emulative feeling in the breasts of our younger brethren. Such an occasion is the present one when we are all thus sociably assembled. Gentlemen, you all know Leary Lipkins. Cheers and cries of, we do, we do. You all know what that he in, is indeed Leary in every sense of the word. Hear, hear. He can see through the best bit of broadcloth that ever covered a swell's pocket. There seems to be a sort of magnetic attraction between his fingers and a gold watch and the fob of, bond, of a Bond Street lounger. Cheers. Talk of mesmerism, why Larry Lipkins can send a gentleman into a complete state of coma as he walks along the street so that he never can possibly feel Larry's hands in his pockets. Gentlemen, I hold Larry Lipkins up to you as an example of excellent health and beg to propose his very good health. The toast was drunk with three times three. Mr. Lipkins returned thanks in, a, in what a newspaper reporter would term a neat speech, and he then exercised the usual privilege of calling upon a particular individual for a song. A certain Master Tripes Todkinson accordingly indulged his companions. Then the Bully Grand proposed the health of Master Tripes Todkinson in a speech which was mightily applauded, and Master Tripes Todkinson, having duly returned thanks, called on Master Bandy-Legged Diggs to continue the vocal harmony. This invitation was responded to with as much readiness as Master Diggs could have displayed in easing an elderly gentleman in a crowd of his purse. We need scarcely observe that their songs were received with as much favor as the preceding ones. The Resurrection Man was, however, growing impatient, for the reader doubtless comprehends enough of his character to be well aware that Titkins was not one who loved pleasure better than business. He took, looked at his watch and cast a significant glance toward the bully grand. What o'clock is it, Mr. Titkins? inquired that great functionary. Half past ten was the answer. Well, I will devote my attentions to you in a few minutes, said Tonks. You may rest perfectly easy. I have obtained information on every point in which you are interested. But hark, shuffling Simon is going to speak. A lad of about seventeen, who had a weakness in the joints of his knees and walked in a fashion which had led to the nickname mentioned by the Bully Grand, rose from his seat and pr proposed the health of Mr. Tonks, the chief of the Society of the Forty Thieves. Then followed a tremendous clattering of bottles and glasses as the company filled up bumpers in order to pay due honor to the toast, and every one, save the Grand himself, rose. The health was drunk with rounds of applause, a pause of a few moments ensued, and then Shuffling Simon commenced a complimentary song, in the repetition of which all the other adherents of the chief vociferously joined. It was really extremely reflect refreshing for the resurrection man to contemplate the deep manifestation of loyalty with which the 39 thieves sang their air. Nor less was it an imposing spectacle when the object of that adoration rose from his seat, waved his right hand, and poured forth his gratitude in a most gracious speech. The ceremony being accomplished, the grand, what a pity it was that so elegant and elevated a personage had retained his unworthy patronymic of tonks took a candle from the table, and conducted the resurrection man downstairs into a back room which the chief denoted his private parlor. Now for your, your information, said the resurrection man somewhat impatiently. In the first place, have you discovered anything concerning Cranky Jem Cuffin? 
My emissaries have been successful in every instance, answered Tonks with a complacent smile. A man exactly corresponding with your description of Cranky Jem dwells in an obscure court in Drury Lane. Here is the address. Any tidings of Margaret Flathers, inquired Titkins. She has married a young man who answers your, your description of Skilligally, and they keep a small chandlery shop in Pitfield Street, Hoxton, Old Town. The name of Mitchell is over the door. Your lads are devilish sharp fellows, Bully Grand, said the Resurrection Man approvingly. With 36 emissaries all over London every day, it is not so very difficult to obtain such information as you required, returned Tonks. Moreover, you paid liberally in advance, and the boys will always be glad to serve you. Now for the next question, said Tidkins, any news of, of the old man that Tomlinson goes to see sometimes? Yes, he lives in a small lodging in Thomas Street, Bethnal Green, was the answer. Here, there is his address also. His name is Nelson. You best know whether it is his right one or not. That is no business of mine. Mr. Tomlinson regularly calls on him every Sunday afternoon and passes some hours with him. The old man never stirs out and is very unwell. Once more, I must compliment your boys, exclaimed Titkins, overjoyed with this intelligence. Have you been able to learn anything concerning Catherine Wilmot? There I have also succeeded, replied Mr. Tonks. My boys discovered that after the trial of Catherine, she lunched with some friends at an inn in the Old Bailey and shortly afterwards left in a post chase. She was accompanied by an old lady and the chase took them to Hounslow. And there, I suppose, all traces of them disappear, said the resurrection man inquiringly. Not at all. I sent Larry Lipkins down to Hounslow yesterday, and he discovered that Miss Wilmot is staying at a farmhouse belonging to a Mr. and Mrs. Bennett. Precisely, exclaimed the resurrection man. That Mrs. Bennett was a witness on the trial. I remember reading all about it. She was the sister of the woman whom Reginald Tracy murdered. The farm is only a short distance from Hounslow, observed the bully ground. Anyone in the town can direct you to it. Most probably it was with this Mrs. Bennett that Miss Wilmot traveled in the post chase. Evidently so, said the Resurrection Man, but of that no matter. All I required was Catherine Wilmot's address, and you have discovered it. Now for my last question. Have you ascertained whether it will be possible to bribe the clerk of the church where Lord Ravensworth and the Honorable Miss Adeline Enfield were married to tear out the leaf of the register which contains the entry of that union? I have learned that the clerk is open to bribery, but he is a cautious man and will not allow himself to be sounded too deeply in the matter, was the answer. Then that business must regard me, observed the Resurrection Man. You have served me well in all these matters. Twenty pounds I gave you the other day. Here are twenty pounds more. Are you satisfied? I have every reason to be pleased with your liberality, returned the bully grand, folding up the banknotes with his delicate fingers. Have you any further commands at present? Yes, replied the replied the Resurrection Man after a few moments' consideration. Let one of your lads take a couple of notes from me. While the bully ground proceeded to summon Larry Lipkins, the resurrection man seated himself at a desk, which there was in the room, and wrote the following note. The news I have just received are rather good than bad. The clerk is open to bribery, but is cautious. I will myself call upon him the day after tomorrow, and I will meet you afterwards at our usual place of appointment in the evening between six and seven. But you must find money somehow or another. I am incurring expenses in this matter and cannot work for nothing. Surely Greenwood will assist you. This letter was sealed and addressed to Gilbert Vernon Esquire, Stamford Street. The resurrection man then penned another note, which ran thus. I have discovered Catherine's address and shall call upon you the day after tomorrow at nine o'clock in the evening. Remain at home as you know the importance of the business. By the time he had concluded his correspondence, the bully grand had returned with Larry Lipkins. My good lad, said the resurrection man addressing the latter, here are the notes which you must deliver this night. This night, mind. The first is addressed, and the person for whom it is intended never retires to bed until very late. He will be up when you call at the house where he lodges in Stamford Street. Give the letter into his own hand. You must then proceed to Golden Lane, and in the third court on the right-hand side of the way, and in the fourth house on the left hand in that court, an old woman lives. You must knock till she answers you, and give her this second letter. I actually do not know her name, although I have dealings with her at present." Okay, so the old lady, that's got to be the old hag, right? Man, now I'm worried about Catherine because we know that the old hag got, um, oh, what's her name? Lady Cecilia to kill herself in order to keep her role in the um, suicide of the, uh, the preacher to be known. So I worry about what she's up to with Catherine. <sighs> And then the other one, 
They are wanting to get rid of the record of a marriage between Adeline Enfield and Lord Ravensworth. And we learned about them in the chapter where um, the poor lady that uh, was taken in um, by Mrs. Chichester uh, was re recounting her history. So, hmm, okay. <laughs> the ch chapter isn't over. I'm just spinning my brain around where all this is going and how worried I am now. <laughs> Especially because Richard is gone. So who's going to look after Catherine? Hmm, okay. Larry Lipkins promised to fulfill these directions and immediately departed to execute them. Shortly afterwards, the resurrection man took his leave of the bully grand and left the headquarters of the 40 thieves. Henry Halford, who had never lost sight of the door of that house since he had seen the resurrection man enter it, and who had remained concealed in the shade of an overhang frontage opposite for more than two hours, resumed his task of dogging that formidable individual. The resurrection man passed down Mint Street into the borough and called a cab from the nearest stand saying to the driver, New Church, Bethnal Green. The moment Titkins was ensconced within and the driver was seated on his box, Henry Halford crept softly behind the cab. In that manner, he rode unmolested until within a short distance of the place of the destination when he descended and followed the vehicle on foot. The cab stopped near the railings that surround the church and the resurrection man, having settled the fare, hurried on onwards into Globe Town. Halford still dogging him, but with utmost caution. Presently, Tidkins struck into a by street at the eastern extremity of the Happy Valley, as our readers will remember Globe Town is denominated in the gazetteer of metropolitan um, thieves, and stopped at the door of a house of dilapidated appearance. In a word, this was the very den where we have before seen him conducting his infamous plots and in the subterranean vaults of which Viola Chichester was imprisoned for a period of three weeks. Holford saw the resurrection man enter this house by the front door communicating with the street. He watched the windows for a few moments and then perceived a light suddenly appear in the room on the upper floor. I have succeeded, exclaimed Holford aloud. The villain lives here. I have traced him to his lurking hole and Jem may yet be avenged. Then, in order to enable to be enabled to give an accurate description of the house to the returned convict, Halford studied its situation and appearance with careful attention. He observed that it was two stories high and that by the side was a dark alley. At length, he was convinced that he should be enabled to find that particular dwelling again or to direct Cranky Jem to it without the possibility of error. And rejoicing at being thus enabled to oblige his new friend, the young man commenced his long and weary walk back to Drury Lane. Okay, that's the end of the chapter. So, uh, the Resurrection Man is uh, up to his eyeballs again and stuff that I'm worried about. Um, I'm sure we'll find out what that is later on. He's back in the old house he um, uh, used to live in with the rattlesnake, uh, the one that had the dungeons underneath. But we also were told that it was rigged to blow up like the last house he was in. So I'm wondering if that's going to come into play. Ah, okay, we'll see what happens in the next chapter. Thank you.